Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Is investing in regenerative agriculture and food only for large investors? In this interview, we discover the role of the crowd in financing the growth of regenerative agriculture and how the current crisis is speeding up everything and why the founder of this crowd investing platform has been personally financing the first deals on the platform. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits, and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash investingregionag or find the link below. Thank you. Welcome to another episode. Today with Dan Miller, founder of Stewart, empowering people to invest in sustainable farms and the farmers who steward them. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for having me. So I'm very, very excited about today as I think I've been telling a lot of people in the past, I would love for the crowd investing, crowdfunding, crowd lending movement to also come to regenerative agriculture. And I think with Stuart, you're one of the first in that space, or maybe even the first. So I'm very much looking forward to explore the role of the crowd in this regenerative transition and revolution. But to start with a personal question, what made you look into soil? Because you have a background in crowdfunding, but not in soil. So what was the trigger? What was the step? How did you end up working on regenerative farms and the funding of them? So the agricultural connection came from my mother's side of the family. They've been farming in the Chesapeake Bay since the late 1800s in the eastern shore of Maryland. So there, you know, it's the largest estuary in the United States. And over one generation, it was destroyed with overfishing and industrial pollutant runoff and industrial agriculture. So she grew up on the farm. I grew up in Washington, D.C., one generation off the farm like many, but not directly connected to it. But we spent a lot of time out there and you saw a region kind of collapse economically, no value going to the local farms, a lot of the farms getting squeezed out by larger producers, and the net benefit of the society and community being destroyed, but also the ecological consequences. So when I decided to commit myself to agriculture in this project, it was only going to be under the lens of regenerative sustainable practices that were focused on ecology first. And I've since learned that ecology first is actually the best investment too, but that in our society is not always, I would say, known. And so for me, it's been connecting all of my background, family history, my experience prior to Steward, and then now using all of those skills to help accelerate the growth of regenerative agriculture, focusing on capital, which is generally the first constraint for any farmer doing this type of work. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, but let's start with one piece. Do you remember when you saw your first regenerative farm or when you saw that potential? Because coming or visiting or having been in a, a region that's actually not regenerating, but degrading, that doesn't mean you also see the potential and the opportunity. So do you remember if there was a moment or a journey or a number of pieces which got you like, wow, agriculture could be different? There were two pieces. So Polyface Farms was in the region I grew up in. They're Joel Salatin. They're obviously very famous. Reading him was the first introduction to the ideas. And we would buy products from him. I pushed my family once I read about him. So that was my first introduction. Uh, Wendell Berry obviously laid the intellectual foundation. I think he does for many people. I read The Unsaid Lake of America. Then that gave me the confidence to believe that there is an alternative way to do agriculture. It actually was the norm throughout most of history, except for the past 100 years. And the reason why ag is as it is, as it is today is because of policy decisions and incentives put in place, not just kind of circumstance. So that gave me the confidence to then look and find who are the farmers doing it differently. And there was a farmer in the Baltimore area who I was connected to through a well-known chef, and he was growing an heirloom variety of peppers called fish peppers. And that's when I started to realize 
these farmers growing really heirloom varieties, really taking care of the soil, doing very unique products, they have no access to financing. They can't get funding anywhere. And that started that the genesis. So it was definitely an interest in the farm. I don't think I ever connected the economics. But then as I really started to work on Stewart and Red Wendell Bear, I realized the economics have to be aligned with the agricultural practices and, and it's a much more symbiotic relationship. Yeah, because you mentioned that probably the biggest bottleneck or one of the biggest bottlenecks is capital. It's not necessarily the not having enough good entrepreneurs or good farmers or entrepreneurial farmers, but it's capital. What made you see that? What made you discover basically that it's the lack of appropriate capital? So that came from my business background before Steward. So after school, I started real estate development business with my brother. My father's family was in real estate. We spun out to do our own projects in Washington, D.C. We're investing in some emerging parts of the city, doing historic restorations, leasing to local tenants. Those were outside of the traditional you know, private equity type deals. So we built a platform to raise money from local investors to invest with us in these projects. That was called Fundrise. It was the first real estate crowdfunding platform, has since grown to raising over a billion dollars online. What was initially used as a vehicle for us to connect with a different type of investor. So around that same time, the buildings that we were leasing to younger chefs, I started to meet the farmers that they were buying from. And any of those farmers I spoke to, even though they're selling to well-known chefs and they're selling at the farmer's market and everyone loves what they have, none of them had access to capital. And it just seemed like a huge gap where demand for their products is exploding, but they can't get the funding to get production up to meet the demand. It's kind of classic economics that they should be able to get that financing, but it's not available. So the idea with Steward was taking the individuals that are supporting this movement, giving them the chance to invest directly in those regenerative farms and farmers. Capital is much needed, but also rebuilding links in a food system. So that's where that connection began. And then in my research and early discovery of the business, it was clear that most funding in agriculture is driven by government policy from government direct lending or through banks that are effectively just lending through government programs. And if you're not a large commodity producer in the US and generally around the world, they've kind of followed this practice. If you're not a large commodity producer, you're ignored and you don't get finance. Whether that's by design or not, that's a different conversation, but they're left out. So 90% of the farms in the US are small to medium farms. Most of the market is this mid-sized to small-sized farmer Many of them are sustainable or would like to do regenerative ag, but without the capital to grow, they can't get there. So there's a whole network, whole different types of farms all around the country and world that we support, but they, they all are persevering in the face of challenges and a little bit of funding goes such a long way for them to grow their businesses. Yeah, just to emphasize, basically the first response of many people that are not in ag would be, okay, you have a f thriving business, a lot of room to grow, chefs that are were buying probably before the crisis and hopefully will be buying after, or a lot of customers on your markets, Rico rings, et cetera. Why don't you go to a local bank and just get a loan to grow? But local banks are either ignoring ag or are focusing on the type of ag that is not this. That's basically what you're saying. And that's where it gets structural of the economic systems we build are focused on larger companies and more standardized practices. So for a smaller scale farm that has a product that's not a classic commodity, so the market value is kind of unknown. They're a little unique in how they run their business and the location and the risk. A bit weird. Yeah, yeah they're strange. <laughs> there are, they're kind of artists a lot of the times. They're different. So they would have trouble getting financing anyway through traditional channels. But the fact that they're not in the, the bucket that the bank can lend to at low risk, they don't do it. And in the U.S., most community banks have closed. Credit unions have closed. So there's been a consolidation of money to the large financial institutions. And this is just not something they're going to touch. So the, the point of Stewart is to bring the capital back locally or regionally some international, but at the end of the day, if you can fund farms from capital within the region, they're getting the benefit of the farm, the land's being helped, they're buying products, they're getting a return. And that's the framework of Steward, not us as the investment decision maker, but us providing the tools for these networks to raise capital and finance farms and us having a balance sheet to do deals as needed to fill the gaps. But ideally, we're just providing tool sets that people can use as well for these farms and their communities to raise capital. And I mean, we've mentioned Stuart a few times now. Can you walk us through a, an example of how that works in practice? What kind of farm, what type of farm, why would they raise capital, what kind of capital, et cetera? What is a good example that gives a bit of color to what we discussed? I'll give a few examples. I'll start with one of the first that was one of the smallest. You know, when I was starting this, I was connected to a few urban farms in Detroit. I find them fascinating. The city has 10,000 acres of excess land that's unused and they have a burgeoning 
urban farming scene, it seems like a perfect mix. Well, these farmers were struggling to be able to buy land from the city for a host of reasons. So we stepped in. I was a farmer farming on a 16th an acre of land in Detroit. One sixteenth, just for the yeah. Sixteenth, basically a lot, you know, a side lot. What would have been a house lot that is yeah. vacant land. It was next door to his uncle's dry cleaner. Fisheye Farms is the name of the farm. And they just started. They had gotten into urban farming in Chicago University. They didn't come from farm backgrounds. They farmed locally. They had a lot of success. And now they needed to expand production. So we came in. We provided funding as a mortgage loan, $120,000 loan that helped them buy a few acres, make investments in fencing, wash and pack, refrigeration, have a farm stand, the kind of basic elements needed for that type of uh, urban fruit and vegetable farm. They've since grown their revenue to 200 k estimated this coming year in two years. And by unlocking their potential to grow more products and sell more direct, they're able to have a bigger impact on the land, but also serve a bigger market. So they've now, particularly since COVID has hit, had tons of direct sales. They have people coming to the farm stand. They're doing pre-packed pickup. They're just perfectly positioned to meet the need of the local community. And then a recent farm, to show the other side of it, was a 1,700-acre livestock farm, a bison ranch in Montana. Bison for me, just like, what's more exciting than bringing American bison back to restore the grassland? So this farmer is similarly passionate and 1,700 acres, and we helped him finance a USDA certified mobile slaughter unit oh, wow. so he could field harvest and sell all around the country. This was prior to the kind of processing issues that are happening in the U.S. and elsewhere. No, but they were already there. Yeah, but of course. They were already there. They Now right. they've just fallen apart, but they always existed. So a lot of what Stewart has become is financing the farmers, but financing also the infrastructure needed to get the product to market because they're all connected to where we were saying with banking is everything's now at a national global level. So if you're looking for smaller scale pools of funding or infrastructure or farms of those size, there's really nothing. I can imagine that. I mean, that slaughter facility, how much was that? Just as a rough number, if that's public? That was $85,000 and he got a grant for 75% of it as matched funding. So in the reality, we helped him with the grant, helped him with the financing. It's not that it was that complicated or huge amount of money. It's just these farmers don't have, they can't just write a check out of their pocket for for these types of expenses. So, no, of course. So they were generally providing loans to the farmers on average 8 to 10% interest rate. So high yield loans, high leverage, generally secured as mortgages, but sometimes we'll do shorter term operating loans. So our view is investors need to be compensated for the risk they're taking. There's always inherently risk in agriculture and regenerative ag. I think regenerative ag has less risk because they control more of the variables for their farm, but that's a separate argument. But high single digits is what we found for investors who are writing checks. And initially, I personally funded the network of these farms of what feels reasonable, what feels like a return. And I think that's where investing in regenerative ag needs to go. And the past generation had no return focus, and it was 1% or 2% could be fine. To really bring the global market in of individuals to support this, there has to be better return. But at the end of the day, the farms can generate those returns. So that's what we've learned at Stewart is with the right mix of funding they're accelerating their business incredibly fast and they can easily afford to pay these rates. And then we also offer at Steward help accessing traditional funding if it's there. And so we can help them refinance into traditional longer term loans. So what began as us writing the checks is now much broader of sustainable farms, regenerative farms come to us. We learn about their business. We make recommendations on what funding's out there between either us or other sources, grants as well. And then what do they need to move forward? So it's become very comprehensive because as you can imagine, these generally regenerative farmers are not focused on financing. It's not an interest for them, but it's important. It's key. And I think, can you elaborate a bit on the interest rates? Because I think for some people that sounds pretty high, but you say they are, you find customers in this case, the farms as customers, and they agree on that, which means there is space to do it. And you say there's enough space and margins in their business to easily afford it. What do you say to people to say, wow, that seems quite expensive in terms of capital? So in the market of general financing, it would still be relatively cheap. I mean, private real estate loans are done at those rates are higher often, and particularly ones where the collateral here is is still land in the business, but is less traditional. Um, so it's what can the business afford? So for us, it's figuring out where can they get to. An investment in value-added processing can double their revenue. That investment of 85K can triple or quadruple revenue to now sell direct. So it's unlocking the investments that really drive value on their end. And then we want to bring them as cheap capital as possible. So 
we have a platform where people can invest as more capital comes online and people accept lower rates that can be provided. We also help the farmers find grants, which effectively subsidizes the rates, which helps a lot. And then we can work alongside traditional funding as it's available. We just did a, a, a deal in Oregon where the Farm Service Agency did the first mortgage for 600000 40-year mortgage at 3.12%, which just shows how subsidized the American <laughs> system is once you access it. You know, a small farm yeah. borrowing at the cost of treasuries, basically. But the local government lender could only lend up to 600 k as a cap in the state. The land costs 800000 So now the farmer's nowhere, you know. And we stepped in as a second mortgage to fill the gap for 150 k and that was at 10%. So the blended rate is low, and without that money, the deal wasn't happening. And now they're on the land, and they're growing, and we're funding irrigation and processing. So I see the returns being there in the underlying business, but definitely the traditional market for ag investing is thinking about uh, lower returns. But I think at the end of the day, they should be shared among the farmers and the investors. I think traditional ag struggles with returns. I see for these sustainable farms, there's a lot of opportunity. And in terms of, because the two things that come back in the transition finance for pharma series, but actually in many conversations are both flexibility and time, yep. meaning build in flexibility in investment products is something very interesting. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that and time. Like a lot of these businesses take a bit of time. It's not a one or two years, maybe the processing plant. Yes. But obviously if you're going to irrigation, going to perennial crops, et cetera, a time is key and investors need to understand that. Yep. Uh, but let's start with the flexibility. How do you tackle the weather risk, the, I mean, one bad year risk, et cetera, et cetera, in, in terms of the loans that sound quite static? So that's our biggest strength, that they're private loans, and so they can be structured however it's appropriate for the farm. For that first loan I mentioned for the urban farm in Detroit, the first year interest was accrued, and then the interest slowly phases in. So they have time to make these investments and start to generate cash flow. Those loans were five years, and we're now refinancing them into traditional longer-term loans from credit unions, because now they own the land and have historical financials to meet those requirements. So I think structuring is the most important thing that's missing. Right now, the ag financing system is like, here's the product, take it or leave it. It's a bank-style product, and it is not going to meet your specific needs. And what we found is cost of capital is not actually the problem. It needs to be reasonable, but that's not the problem. It's access to funding and then funding structure in the right way. That's really the primary problem. And then if they can get it structured in the right way, where they have time to grow the business, where it's enough term to have the payback, and where it gets them a bridge to traditional funding a few years down the road, then it works perfectly. So that's the big differentiator. There's very little private lending capital in agriculture. And I think in general, private investment capital offers the flexibility to meet these farmers where they are. And in terms of flexibility, have you looked at or experimented with, I don't know, with any of the, let's say, not fixed interest rates, but connected to free cash flow, connected to profit sharing? Is that something you have been thinking either thinking of and using, or is it something that, that is not a fit yet? That is something that we're implementing. So there's two ways people can invest on Steward. They can come to the platform and invest in the farms or the fund that we have set up, the Steward Farm Trust. And that's us underwriting the deals, writing the check ourselves, doing all the due diligence. When you say us, as you underwriting. Us as right? Steward. Well, I mean, our team, but yes. <laughs> us is, So they're reliant on us and our underwriting and securing a mortgage and making sure that everything works. We're also now rolled out our software to farmers where they can use the fundraising tool we have built, which allows them to distribute an offering in a compliant way, raise funding, and we're setting up some of those offerings as revenue shares, particularly the ones that allow anybody to invest. So we're working, let's say, in Oregon. We have a license now where any Oregon resident can invest in the Oregon farms in our platform, little as in you know, $100 or any amount. There where you have a lot of smaller investors and you want to align their interests with the farm to promote the farm, to buy from the farm, to really engage, that's where I think RevShare works. So I view the, the kind of accredited style investors that are investing 10 to 25K and up they want classic, you know, collateral, mortgages. We have some tax-free products. Everyone loves that, of course. Whereas the local investor that just loves that farm, they buy from them, they see them at the farmer's market, they want to put in a thousand bucks. They're more suited to a project where they're going to get some products and they'll get a share of revenue. So we're, we're adapting the structure to the need of the farmer and to where it sits in the capital stack. Yeah, because for now, most of what you've described is accessible for accredited investors and up 
because of legislation, right? Except for the Oregon piece you, you just mentioned, like the two farms you mentioned, the processing unit, et cetera, isn't yet accessible for somebody to put in a hundred bucks. So we do have a product that's available to any U.S. resident, non-accredited as well, as little as a hundred. That's called the Steward Farm Trust. So that vehicle makes loans to all the farms in the Steward platform. And then as it earns interest, pays out dividends. So that was set up to channel small dollar individual investors. Alongside that, accredited high net worth have more flexibility to invest either in that fund or in individual deals or in portfolios of deals. What we've been trying to do from the start, and this goes to my background at Fundrise too, of how do we get individuals at a local level investing in these farms? The regulatory cost to do that in the US is $100,000 or so. You know, it doesn't work for a farmer trying to get 100000 but we're now innovating on state-based crowdfunding rules where as long as all the residents are from the state the farm's from, they're exempt from federal law. Under state law, we have certain states that allow local investors. So now we have a platform license, let's say in Oregon. And for me, that's just exciting of local capital with local farms at the actual local level of who buys from this farm, who's connected to them. I think that's the real power. So it's been years of us wading through regulations and trying different methods and using now we're using rules that are, you know, 200 years old on the books, but no one ever really thinks about them. And that's what we try to do. What are all the ways that we can bring in more investment for regenerative ag? Because we need everything, everything that's out there is a, is a huge amount of capital needed to not only transition conventional to regenerative, but, but fund the regenerative farms already out there today. And that's an interesting point. How many of the projects either you've done or looked at, et cetera, are conventional to regenerative and how many have been, let's say, regenerative from the start or regenerative, like, let's say, relatively new farms that want to grow? Has there been something on the transition side of things, which I think is a huge opportunity, but also very difficult? The transition has picked up recently. So the beginning of Steward was purely regenerative focus. We're getting applications from farms who are already regenerative. The first 16 we funded all regenerative. Uh, we had over 2,000 applications in the first year. So it's just kind of huge inflow of applicants. So the first focus was who's already farming today, doing important work, established products, established markets, and now they need growth capital to take the next step. That's where we started. And this could be the market gardens, the urban farms you mentioned, the processing units, the, the examples you, you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. And so they already have their market built in and now they need to expand production. For me, that's a very simple economic proposition. The sales are there. They just need more production. And those are a lot of the farms that are doing a few hundred acres and less. We've now had outreach from a lot more conventional farms. One that recently spoke to us in Minnesota, they inherited three brothers, the land from their father recently. They started the conversion to regenerative from conventional, but they need funding to fill that gap. And I think that's going to be a financial product that's very important to steward of what's the transitional funding from conventional regenerative. It has to accrue. It has to be flexible while the yields switch. Also helping those farmers plan out instead of just doing traditional soy on a conversion, maybe let's look at some heritage grains. Let's see what's out there to really do a diverse mix instead of just a monoculture of organic, which I think happens too often. So I think that will be a big market for us. And when people look at regenerative ag, they think of it as a niche market, but it's really the other way around. That's how agriculture has been done forever, always in the history of the world, except for the past hundred years when we had fossil fuels and you know the kind of expansion of energy beyond the normal sources of it. So input heavy, yeah. Yes. So it's where most farming will be just based on resources and costs and use, let alone the kind of ecological impacts that are important to more and more people. And how much of your work then will be basically consulting or advising if you start advising on grain mixes, et cetera, it's very different from running a platform. Is that a risk? I mean, it's very interesting, obviously, but is that a risk from helping these three brothers and many others also making the farm transition, not just a financial transition? So we have a broad team, you know, with different skill sets. We have a team called Farm Stewards that are experienced farmers who help advise and support the farmers in our network. The head of that team lives in North Carolina. He's run a farm incubator for over 10 years. He spent many years supporting farmers in planning, and that's a service that we offer alongside. So people come to us in those conversations of what financing do you need is also, well, where is your farm? What are the bottlenecks? What can we help? And can we make some connections to local advisors? So that's kind of built in the steward platform. What's the network and infrastructure and expertise needed? So what started out as just a lending investment platform 
has very much brought into all types of services for farmers. We help farmers with direct to consumer sales for e-commerce. We help with bookkeeping. So we provide these services to take off their plate a lot of the work that they're supposed to do. And particularly for these smaller scale farms, they don't have different divisions and departments. They're very lean operations. And so they don't have time to do bookkeeping and grant writing and set up websites. And so we've realized that probably the primary value long-term is going to be in the network and tech tools and infrastructure to help them support their businesses. And then the funding is fundamental to their growth. But the need for the regenerative farmers is broader than funding, although access to capital definitely is, is first on the list for most. And that turns into another business, basically, because you're not just providing the funding or the platform for funding and maybe access to funding, but you're also providing all of this potentially websites, bookkeeping, et cetera. That is a separate business, right? The, the steward farm services, if I'm uh, correct. Yep. A separate business, recurring revenue, kind of less risk. I personally, for me, the funding is core to both. A lot of businesses, once they build their platform, they add funding. You know, I know Square, for example, does that, right? They're supporting small merchants, they add funding. It's not, I mean, if you can have a look, I mean, there are privacy laws, obviously, but if you can see in the bookkeeping who's doing well, just like banks do, very easy to monitor who's able to take on some funding. So that's what we've found. And help the bookkeeping helps you as an investor as well. Yeah. That it all mixes the kind of core products we offer is access to capital, either the tool to raise it themselves or committed funding from us. Then bookkeeping to manage the books and keep everything organized. And then e-commerce support to help with direct consumer sales, particularly since COVID, obviously, that's of critical importance to farmers. Let's talk about COVID. What have you seen? Um, I see, saw you out there on a few interviews saying this is this something along the lines, but correct me if I'm wrong. This is the moment for food systems. But what have you seen in the fields, actually? The farmers you work with, the farmers, it, how has it been? It's now May 2020. Maybe people listen to this years now, but we're still many parts in lockdown. And it seems to be that local food systems are taking off. But what have you seen with the people you talk to, the investors, the farmers? What has it been like in the last few months? We built Steward from the ground up to support small to mid-sized regenerative farmers. That used to be considered a niche market. Now it's the only profitable sector of all of agriculture. You know, it's, it's like it, those are the ones that have exploding demand. Customers who bought from them five years ago have been calling. They're all selling everything they have you know, and even having to manage to limit sales because there's so much demand. So the, the farmer that we generally support growing on the land, selling direct to consumer, their sales have just exploded. The challenge a lot of them have is the operational infrastructure to now manage a flood of retail orders. So that's where an e-commerce system, even if it's just for on-farm pickup, is very helpful in the tools to manage that. And then the funding is the thing that people forget where we just had a farm last week. They're shipping livestock and poultry to New York City from upstate New York. Their sales have just gone crazy, but now they need more freezer capacity. So now they need a few hundred thousand dollar investment to expand their freezer capacity, which they would share with other farms. So the sales growth that's taken off now, which is where all the attention is, is everyone's buying from these farms. It's fantastic. It's great. But then nobody's realizing, well, where's all the money going to be then to get that infrastructure to actually meet the demand that surged? And that, I think, stewards uniquely positioned for. And in general, that's where access to capital continues to cripple the movement. But for us, it's investors are more engaged than ever. There's more capital that wants to invest this than ever in the farms. And now we're actually working on some processing infrastructure like that, shared freezer capacity and value-added processing. So I see it being the whole network needs that support and needs to be integrated. And when the dust settles a bit, I mean, nobody knows how long and what the new normal looks like. What is your idea there? Is, is everybody going to go back to buying chickens from the supermarket or absolutely not? Is this a, the watershed moment for the movement? What do you think? I think it is a fundamental shift. Obviously, the demand will drop back somewhat because you never keep 100% of new growth, but I think it's going to be on a new trend line. What happened in this moment was the farms had to streamline their enterprises. So the ones that really had a good direct-to-consumer system built a really efficient machine that was very easy for customers. And now for a customer, that experience of buying right from a farm is as easy as any other shopping experience that they have. With a very different quality. <laughs> yes, much better quality. And that's the reality is if the best quality product doesn't ever make it to the grocery store because there's not that much of it and the margins the grocers and distributors take doesn't make any sense. So if you want the best product, you have to go right to the farm. And then for the farmer, direct sale is the best that they can get. So it's so aligned. And now with technology making it so easy, it's growing. But many farms that were just wholesale to restaurants 
now have to shift. That's a challenge. A lot of farms that are conventional and even large scale commodity, they're selling through tons of intermediaries. So one of the key things we advise on all farms is just like we're trying to get your capital direct of get the investors right to your farm, try to make all sales direct as much as possible, remove the intermediary, take the margin yourself. And that's now what COVID's created. That direct to consumer channel has exploded. So not all farms are grabbing it, but it's there. And I, and I do think it's going to continue to grow. So it, our interest has skyrocketed. I think anybody who's farming on the ground, their interest has skyrocketed. They're nervous about when it ends. So they're waiting to invest until then. You know, this farm with the freezer capacity, they want to see six more months of this before they make that investment. But I believe that it's going to continue. And we've had farms say, even if they had 10% of the, the demand, they would have full sales of everything. So it's far beyond the capacity for any of these wow. producers to meet. And what is your biggest challenge now, but let's say also post COVID or after the dust settles, what's the biggest challenge for Stewart at the moment? So the hardest part with Stewart is the operational regulatory infrastructure around compliant securities offerings, making sure deals are vetted and underwritten, the whole framework around that. I mean, at Fundrise, we pioneered the idea of crowdfunding online and use regulations that were, you know, had been, not been used in a long time to try to make that possible. Similarly with Stewart, we're trying to push forward of how do you bring more and more investors in at the right level, in the right structure to the farms. And that's been years in the making. And we now have that infrastructure set up. And so now it's really about bringing the capital online to support the farms and expanding it. So it's we're in growth mode where if somebody comes to us ready to invest, they can pick among this whole network of farms. And as farms come to us, we can deliver value to them. But at the end of the day, the systems we've built are very niche and very complicated to do something simple. Like how hard is it to have a local resident in Oregon invest in a farm in Oregon? It seems like it should be very simple, but that's not the norm. And in order to make that and facilitate that, it requires really nuanced technology and regulatory understanding. But that's my contribution to regenerative agriculture of really in-depth knowledge on financing and regulations and raising money online and everything that's needed to bring capital in, because everybody's known for a long time access to capital is the problem. That's well understood. It's how do you then get the money to where it needs to go efficiently? How do you build a machine? Yeah. Yeah. And without just start funding 100,000 acre farms, which is all that exists historically in regenerative ag of big pension funds, family offices, owning 1,000 acre tracts of land plus. But the reality is most of the market is let's say 5,000 acres and below. So most of the market is not where the first wave of large scale money is. So we need to kind of back to the crowdfunding, get many people involved. Even people are writing 50K checks, 100K checks, that's still crowdfunding. It's not, it doesn't have to be small. It's are they able to access it easily and is it broadly available at ease? And that that system mixed with actually understanding the farms is a lot to get streamlined. Yeah, I know. I know some examples in the renewable energy space which I know the, it's, I wouldn't say equally challenging. It's very tricky, obviously, to do, but at least there you have, you're not dealing with a life system. You're dealing with solar panels, wind turbines, and that's pretty much it. And that's already very, very complicated. Imagine if you bring that whole crowd piece and all the regulation to the agriculture space where everything is moving and everything is alive. Yep. And yeah, I can imagine. So can you give us a lay of the land? We're now in May 2020. How long has Stuart been around? How many people are you? How many farms did you fund it? And how much money has gone through the pipes, basically, of the system? Just to have a bit of an understanding where you're at. I started working on Stuart in 2016, just researching, learning, meeting with farmers. When we launched the podcast, yeah. Yeah, right around then. I, I, you know, that was early days. I had started to meet these farmers, but the idea of what can these farmers, what do they need? What can they afford to pay? How are their businesses run? Are, can they be successful? You hear all the time, small farms are struggling. Are they viable enterprises? So that was a long discovery phase for me. The first farms we funded were two in 2017 in the summer. That was us really doing our test case of getting the structure in place, getting the investment vehicle up. Those were loans that I personally funded to really understand how are they going to perform? How, how is it going to work? Then 2018, we brought in the pilot and we funded 10 farms across the country, Oregon, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, livestock, fruit and vegetable, winemaker, everything. One in Europe, which was a winemaker in Switzerland, natural wines up in the Alps. So really saw the reach of this isn't limited to certain parts of the world. This is an issue everywhere. 
these farmers are working all over the country in the US and all over the world, but access to capital is an issue for all of them. Then last year, we launched the first investment products so that people can come to the website, invest in the projects on the website. We have over $3 million invested through that product. And then each day we're adding new farms. So we have over 20 farms that have been funded. We have over 2,000 that have applied that we're now bringing through our services platform. We have another 50 plus that are using different services from bookkeeping, e-commerce to all the different backend services. So what the past year has been of discovering regenerative agriculture, doing a few transactions to really figure things out, just getting a flood of demand from applicants and realizing that there's huge scale and opportunity here, and then building the systems to bring those in, broaden our offering from just funding to support across the entire enterprise, and then weaving through the regulations now to, to open up more types of investment. So we're, you know, it feels like all of that groundwork and preparation was done now for this moment of the attention now being on the sector and people wanting to easily figure out if I want to invest in regenerative agriculture, how do I do it? And we've spent years and time and capital and effort of putting the systems in place to make that seamless. And it's a question I, I don't always ask, I think, but how involved are farmers in Stewart? I had a discussion with an ag tech or somebody's looking at a lot of ag tech companies recently, and she mentioned very often the last time they talked to a farmer was a very long time ago, meaning they built something for a lot of money and probably doesn't connect to farmers. Like there should be a farmer on board of, of any company, honestly, or somewhere very much involved part of the company. We had a discussion with uh, yes. with a soy sauce brewer that actually have their farmer that makes the soy for the soy sauce is part of the company, et cetera, et cetera. So how involved, I'm setting up the question very badly, but how involved are farmers in Stewart in terms of the team, in terms of advisory board, et cetera? Yeah, we're very connected with the farmers. We're always communicating with them regularly, even through text message and you know very close relationships. We have a farmer on our team. His name's Aaron Newton. He's the one I mentioned who leads the farm steward team. So he personally has 20 years experience farming, running a farm incubator for over 10. And he works with the farmers as they come through and has a phone call and helps advise them. And he has a network of experienced farmers that have worked at other farm incubators that he's met around the world that support these farms. So we're very agricultural focused. I don't even like thinking of us as ag tech because I find so much of ag tech is let's do really advanced technology solutions for the mega farms, you know, spectral imaging and drones and automated everything. Digitalize everything. Yeah. Digitize and get rid of the people for sure. That's always the focus. Of course, robots would be the solution. Yeah. Whereas why don't we just have simple tools for the farmers, like just get them with the basic elements that they need. And so for us, it's providing those tools, software they can use, help with bookkeeping, but it's more of how can we take this out of your hands so you can just focus on the farming and some of these backend elements are saved. So we try to be very easy to interface with the farm. We have farmers on our team. We care deeply about them and we're in discussions with them regularly. I'm actually speaking to a farmer tomorrow who's a cheesemaker in Southern Oregon who are helping get financing to buy their land. And, you know, we talk every few months and there's definitely a close relationship and I've visited them a few times. So my passion comes from that of meeting the farmer where they are and supporting them in the way that fits them as opposed to here's some advanced solution we want and we just want to scale it and every farm's a number and let's just get 100,000 farms. It's really unique to that farm and that's regenerative agriculture that each farmer is different in how they approach it and their background and what they want to do. And in terms of Let's switch a bit to the investor side. You mentioned it's accessible, and obviously this is not investment advice, but it's accessible for anybody living in the US. Did it also mean for the Swiss farm, the winemaker you mentioned, was that finance from the US? How is this in terms of accessibility at the moment, which can obviously change, Yes. but in, just to give people an idea, um, who can access the platform from the investor side? We try to be as broad as possible, and that's our experience in these rules and regulations. So we can have investors from anywhere in the world, as long as they're accredited, and we have a process where they can submit those materials. So that allows investors from all around the world to invest in these farms. We then also try to allow as much local investment as possible. So for US-based investors, any of them can invest in the main project. And then you mentioned the Swiss winemaker, the Oregon farm. Then at the regional level, the kind of state level, we try to figure out what are rules there to allow local investment. But that's at a you know that those are the hardest ones to comply with because it's country by country and farm by farm. So we have a broad layer 
of the family office, high net worth investor who's really anchoring a lot of these investments, and then try to open that up to individuals at a few thousand dollars in lesser amounts. So it's the pairing of all types of funding that's really needed. And the way that the general framework for securities law is written around the world is if you're high net worth, you're exempt from most of the rules and you can invest in any deal. And if you're not, that's when get things get complicated. So we're built to open it up to anybody and we adapt and figure out how to use all those rules as possible. There's always some gaps, but at the end of the day, it's bringing and opening it up to as many people as possible. And in terms of you've done the Swiss farm, I don't want to keep coming back to that one, but what are your plans internationally beyond the U.S.? So we had a huge amount of outreach from farms all across the world. Canada, New Zealand, and Australia have been particularly big. Those we have farms that are already in our queue. I actually just spoke with a oyster farm in New South Wales, about four hours south of Sydney. He already has raised money for his oyster farm through his local network. So now he can use our software tool to broaden that and have that offering online where he can then share it to his email list and those people can invest. So he's now able to use our technology without us writing the check, but use the system for his network in Australia. And that's really where I'm seeing the growth now in Steward of here's the tool that allows you to tap into these investors easily. And here's how you can use it compliantly. And we have such a broader reach at that point, because I may personally underwriting that deal in Australia is going to be tough. And we're going to build local resources over time to do deals from our balance sheet in those markets and others. But if there's a great farmer on the ground who has a network and access to potential investors, why not give them a tool to facilitate it and build them into the network? So as we've gone from direct lending and direct investment to tools, whether that's a bookkeeping or e-commerce or fundraising tool, that's really allowed us to support the international market. For me, there is no geographic boundary to this work. Is demand for it and a need for it everywhere. So it's just a matter of balancing what can you support and then what's the operational infrastructure to do that. And that means that, let's say in Australia, there wasn't or isn't a platform that is able to do it. And for this farmer, it makes more sense to license basically to take the steward platform than to find a local, some kind of local solution to handle the investors that he has already. Yeah. So he had, creates a profile on the steward platform and he sets up his offering and he shares it with his investor. We don't take a percent of fee. We just charge a monthly SaaS fee. So it's effectively software as a service. So the reality is the work we're doing around fundraising is very advanced. Like Mm -hmm. I've done this for 10 years in two companies of how do you really open up investment, but make it simple and compliant. So and that compliant part is the same in Australia, would be the same in Italy or depends on the country. So that's something that could be limiting country by country. That is part of a limiting factor. And you find out, you know, what are the rules? Generally, there's a similar carve out where the higher level investors can easily invest. And if you want small local, you have to do some more filings and we can assist with that. But I think the other focus is we're just committed to sustainable agriculture. And so there's an alignment with these farmers. They come to us. We care about the work they're doing. You're not doing any other type of farmer. We understand their business, no other type of farmer. We know about, okay, you need this for working capital. How about this? How about that? Or if you're looking to buy land, this is an option. That's an option. So the fact that that's all we do, only regenerative agriculture, which, you know. I probably have a nice network of alumni, alumni farmers or farmers that are still being, still financed, et cetera. That connection between them globally is very interesting. And that's already been building. And I just connected that urban farm in Detroit with an urban farm in Washington, D.C. that applied to us. So we're already seeing that network effect. So that's been the shift from us as kind of investor lender to us as platform, because the scale of the market is so huge. There's so many of these farmers out there that need resources and support. So let's bring all of them on. You have any idea about the size that even just the U.S., because for sure you have better numbers, like to give us an idea of how many could even be eligible or interesting from an investor perspective? Let's give it a, you have any, any idea of the market? It's completely underestimated and it bothers me in the classic way where the USDA has so many studies on conventional ag on everything, the exact amount of bushels of corn per acre in this county, like everything. And then the second you talk about, we'll focus on sustainable ag and these smaller farms, nothing. They're like, that's the other category. So there really is not reliable data. I think the data is way underestimating. We see farmers all around the country, all different backgrounds, 
in regions that you would definitely not consider, spots, you know, yeah. rural Louisiana, places that don't aren't that aren't where you envision this type of agriculture. And then we started marketing around the world, Mexico, for example, and got hundreds of applicants overnight. In the U.S., we estimate there's two million. It's a fact that there's two million small to mid-sized farms. We put 25 percent as who today meets those parameters, so that's half a million. But the market of smaller farms is growing for the first time in 100 years, so that's an increase. And the share of farmers that are being sustainable, regenerative, conventional over is growing. So it's like you're in the part of the market with the base number growing and the ratio growing. So I, I'm a huge believer, but part of my discovery experience with Stuart was that of like, well, what really is the scale of this market and how do you reach them easily? And we found through digital ads and through network effects and through referrals they're all out there and they all have similar problems and they're looking for support and that's generally pretty hard to come by. Oh, very, very interesting. And just to shift gears a bit, what I always like to ask, obviously, again, not giving investment advice, but if you would there, imagine there's a theater full of, of smart investors, smart impact investors, they are convinced about soil, they read the books, they visited some farms. What would you give them as guidance? What kind of questions should they ask before they make their first investment in the regenerative food and egg space? What should they look out for? What are things you definitely put in their backpack as they go out and explore that investment side? I always think they should start of what means the most to them. So is it a certain region that matters, maybe where they grew up or they have a connection to, they want to support farmers there? Or is there a product type where they are obsessed, let's say, with cheese and they want to support a cheese maker? Like, I hear something about that. Yeah, the second time you bring up cheese, that's interesting. <laughs> I mean, definitely, I'm for sure. It's, you know, the, the enjoying the products is one of the best parts. So I think of it as you're building a close relationship with the farmer by investing in them. You can invest in a fund, but you can also invest directly in a farmer. And I think the more engaged you are of, let me speak to the farmer, let me understand them and how I'm helping them and what is important to them. I always think that's a good place to start. We have all types of investors. We have individuals that are obsessed with the farms and want to visit them and want to talk to them and want to volunteer and help with harvest and do everything. And then we have the more classic family office where they have a mandate and they want to do more sustainable investing and they're kind of allocating and they want to put five million spread across this many deals. And those can be done too of, you know, here's the portfolio, these are the different transactions. They're all secured mortgages between eight and ten percent. You know, if you want tax free, it can be this. So they're very different conversations, but the, the first group where they are passionate about this work and they want to see it happen, I think the more they can be connected to the things they're investing in and feel that connection and understand it, the easier it is for them to take that first step because it's a very non-traditional investment. And if they're just wanting it to look like a classic commercial real estate investment, it, it is a little bit different. It still is real estate. It still fits those characteristics, but you have an operating business that's dealing with nature and land on top of it. So I think that that personal connection is a driver. And, and we find that all the time, that one of the larger investors in the deal may have grown up nearby that farm, or they used to farm at one point and they want to support it. It's a lot of successful entrepreneurs who've made their money and now want to reinvest and have that have a positive impact. So I'm, I'm hearing from those investors all the time. But I think to get over the hump, the more they can feel a personal connection with that farmer, that project, the more likely they are to do it. Especially the first ones, yeah. It's probably the advice I give the most. Go and talk to farmers. Go and spend time on farms. I know. Actually, go visit them. I know. Go visit. You will learn a lot. And it's not so easy. And it's actually not so complicated. It's very complex. But go and talk, spend time, listen. And especially if you didn't grow up on a farm, especially if you haven't been on regenerative farms recently, you'll be in for a few surprises, which is good. A good surprise, not bad ones. but Go and talk, go and learn, go and ask questions because there's a lot to discover there. And you will find ways to put money to work. I completely agree. So visit the farm. And that's what we really try to do at Stewart of how do we engage those customers who care about the farm? They may see the farm, the farmer's market. How do they get further putting capital at the farms? A lot of them are building homes to stay out on the farms for rental. Like, How do we engage people in the world of agriculture? Because that's been the big problem. In the US, is 1890s, Half the population was in agriculture. Now it's 2%. So we've just pushed everybody off the farm and 2% doesn't work very well. Obviously, removing all the farmers and scaling the farms has a lot of external consequences. So now we need to think about how are we going to get those millions or hundreds of millions across the world back into this? 
they're not all going to be farmers, but they have a role. Yeah. They can use their capital. They can use their purchasing power. They can use their expertise. You know, whatever it takes, they need to put their resources, even if it's not just capital, but any resource they have towards these farmers, because they're facing a lot of challenges, and the work they do is very important. And without that support, they they have trouble. And very lonely. I think that's something we yes. in the city underestimate, and I I think we're being pushed to acknowledge that we're in this crisis and in many other crises are extremely disconnected from nature and one of the best ways probably to get back into that is not only go out in nature which on regenerative farms is everywhere but experience that and the best way i think to reconnect is through food through agriculture and discover that connection and it can be through your purchasing can be through your visiting in terms of tourism and can be through your investment dollars or euros or yens or whatever you're investing yeah and that's where my connection began too from the restaurant side of seeing chefs and working with chefs who had huge demand for their products were very passionate about what they were buying so i think that's how the movement really translates from purchasing dollars to investment dollars is people who are connected through food chefs are the ones with the pedestal to actually draw attention and converting those customers is the first step and that's often the conversation with investors you talk about food a lot because that's what matters to them or that's the experience it's easy and wine the, the swiss winemaker too that he sells natural wines hand harvested up in the alps you know at a thousand meters that's just a product that people are connected to it's not difficult to have people feel like i see i see the combination really in the <laughs> it's a good portfolio oysters and wine and no no it is i mean it is it's more sexy than than a wind turbine, which I'm actually staring at, honestly, outside this window. But it's definitely something people connect much more to than than the electricity coming out of their grid, yeah. which is fundamental. And we definitely have to decarbonize. It's one of the reasons I'm recording the podcast. I saw with investors the interest. If you ask them on surveys, the interest we asked them at Tonic in food and egg was always very high. But if you looked at their portfolios, they invested mostly in renewable energy and other sectors. And food and egg was always very very small. And I didn't understand because I saw all these people building very interesting things and like, how come that it's not part of more portfolios? Because it's not that easy. I mean, their structures and infrastructure is needed to do it. And finally, now, years later, we're seeing more of those structures being built. To ask, I mean, this is a question you might have thought about, actually. Not many people do in this space, which is the reason I'm asking it. And what if tomorrow morning you would have, or tonight, you'd be in charge of a $1 billion portfolio? You can invest it any way you want. What would be, let's say, a few carve-outs, what would be more or less the pie chart you would put that money to work? Could be any duration you want, but it has to be invested, not granted. That's the infrastructure we've built at Steward to handle that capacity. My previous venture fund rise is at a billion of AUM from all online retail investors. So my vision was Steward for the beginning of let's do it from the grassroots. Let's start with one acre farm, then 20 acre, then 100, then 1,000, but let's build the infrastructure needed to support these farms all across the country and world to deploy the capital, but also to actually ensure those businesses are successful. So for us, it's just expanding our remit. We have thousands of farms already in our network and deals underwritten all around the country. But what I wouldn't do is start to do huge deals. I think the problem in agriculture is that the money is chasing the kind of very large 10,000 plus acre type transactions or perennial row crops, the small medium enterprise, the few hundred acres, few thousand acres, even the one acre farm, that's where the funding's needed. So I would have it still be invested in chunks of hundred thousand, a few million. I would say that's kind of our sweet spot for financing. Like most of the farms are looking for a few hundred thousand to a million. And then some of them are a million to five million. And that is the broad based support that is needed. So you know that the point of Steward is to build the infrastructure that can deploy that money in an organized way, but also provide feedback and information to the investors and build those connections. So I'm hoping that's where we are in a few years. And if you could wave, so you're no longer, or not yet in charge of one, one billion dollar fund. If you could wave a magic wand and tomorrow morning we wake up and one thing in the food and egg space or industry has changed, what would that be? What would be your magic power and one thing you could change? My discovery for Sustainable ag came, you know, through the farmer and then from the farmer's eyes being confused as to their lack of access to capital. And at the end of the day, the lack of access to capital related to government regulations and government policy that over years had kind of created the wrong incentives. So I go back to the roots of if we just removed any of the national, federal, global ag policy and subsidies and incentives and just said, well, 
what farms can support themselves and how does it work in practice. Sustainable ag would have such more growth because they're not reliant on third parties, not reliant on price supports, not reliant on subsidized external costs. So I, I look at the kind of goal to incentivize large commodity production as having such huge negative effects. Yes, it has created calories for people to eat, and there's lots of arguments around those benefits, maybe, maybe not. They're feeding the world. Yes, that's what you always hear from. And, you know, yes, they're creating calories, but let's, instead of shipping to people all around the world, let's create local capacity in these regions to produce for themselves, to sell directly and to provide ecosystems, just like I began with the Chesapeake Bay, to restore and maintain the actual environmental and social quality of life. So I would hope, and it's kind of in the U.S., 2% of the farm bill like goes to sustainable ag. They're like, yay, we've got more money. It's like, well, it's still all going in the wrong direction generally. 98%. Yeah, so I, I that's where I am at is I, if I wish it was a level playing field because then these types of practices... They wouldn't stand a chance yeah. against the region farmers we know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, the, the EU is launching a huge farm to fork plan, which we have to see how, but at least it talks a lot of the talk. Let's see. I mean, let me know in the comments below what you think about that. They're farther ahead, though. I would say the policy in Europe, they're trying to be more focused on land management. They're pushing for organic. There's a strong push for organic. I don't know if they know the potential, let's say, to go beyond or the potential destruction of uh, destructive practices that can be part of industrial organic. But at least it's a push. It's a discussion on chemical use. It's a discussion on obesity, which actually is part of the same program. It's a discussion on land use. It's a discussion on not on a fertilizer use, et cetera. That, that discussion we haven't had in the last years, at least not at that level. So Yeah, I agree. And, and we do a lot of work at Stewart at local and state level. And so the kind of state rules we use to rate, have funding. Yeah, it's the, it's the countries here, yeah. and the, the regions that are the strong. There's the region up here in, in the north of Italy that did a referendum and cut out all, all chemical use in farming. And they gave the farmers a, a, wow. an ultimatum, like either move, after a lot of research and they saw there was a lot of pesticide actually floating off the non-regenerative farms to a number of organic farms, although the, the non-regenerative farms said that it was impossible. It stayed within their apple orchard. Obviously, it wasn't true. And they found a lot of the residue in milk and in cheese production, etc. And so they did a referendum and they gave the farms an ultimate. Either you switch to organic or you have to move from the state because we're not no longer going to support. It's going to be illegal here to not farm organically. And that's what we're finding in certain markets. Oregon is one where they've been very progressive on policies to enable local farmers, support local farmers, incentivize it. So we're trying to design at the local regional level, what are policies and frameworks at work in terms of access to capital and incentivizing the right type of ag. And then those can be broadened. And I like that work because it's you have to push against the system that's been built. You know, The reason we're farming as we are today is because of the government and social structures around it. And so if you're going to try to improve regenerative agriculture, you have to look at the base impacts to it. Another thing connected to that is I think too many people focus on labels in this work. You've mentioned organic, industrial organic. Organic in and of itself doesn't mean that much anymore. It's definitely been co-opted a bit as an industry term. A lot of the farms we work with, they don't even go through the certification because they have customers who visit them and buy on farm and believe in the products. And by seeing it and visiting it, you're going to get more than you would ever with the certification. So as people focus on investing in regenerative agriculture, I hope it doesn't just become another commodity system where you need, you need just a certification. People aren't looking at the underlying practices, yeah. which at the end of the day are what matters, not the label that's posted and stamped on the food. No, absolutely. I think it's, yeah, it's the underlying practices and being able to show what you have done and the transparency and the fact that you can visit many of these farms, I think already says something compared to a lot of other farms that you we chased off by with dogs probably if you even show up at the gate which strange idea says something about the yeah. very weird like what would they be hiding potentially possibly final question which is something that i took uh, definitely inspired by john kemp what do you believe to be true about regenerative agriculture he asked about general agriculture but let's say regenerative agriculture that others don't believe to be true I mean, we had a few already in it but what would be one you if you had to pick one? For me, it's about understanding the business model and that there is viability in the business model. There's been studies that have shown that the organic matter in the soil actually is the closest correlation to return 
because your soil is actually producing the product. I read those, yeah. <laughs> I had John Lentken on the podcast. It's not released yet. Maybe when you're listening to this, it is, which was fascinating. Profitability and Regen Ag. And they're coming out not just with the study they did in 2018, but with many more, hopefully this year, which are going to be very interesting and scary for us few industries, particularly almonds, rangelands, etc. But it's surprising how, how few there are. Like how many studies are there on profitability and region egg? I found one, which is very scary. Very little. Everyone's referencing the same study. And what I see with these farms, and I had to learn it by doing, is they keep their expenses very low. They're not buying big purchased inputs. They're not buying chemicals. They buy seeds and maybe some other basic inputs. They have very low overhead because they're lean operations. They use small tools or mid-sized equipment, and they have moderate sizes of land. And then they sell direct to the end user where they can get high margin, you know, 40, 50, 60%. And then they recycle that. So it's a very simple and straightforward business. There's going to be variability in production and there are many elements, but at the end of the day, you're growing from the sun, improving the soil, selling direct. And that boost of funding and people say, well, what can they afford to pay? What are returns reasonable? If that system's set up and then you can fund a few hundred thousand dollars to get control of land and fencing and equipment, irrigation, evaluated processing and some transport and some labor, you can accelerate that business so much. It's such a huge opportunity. And I think when people think of regenerative agriculture, they assume it's not competitive on that it can produce a reasonable return. And I, I think it is both. I don't expect it to produce hedge fund returns. No one should look at 20%. That's just our system. They haven't been amazing lately. No, they have, well, it's, it's the theoretical return, right? It's like you're, the pitch. But I think people should be very happy with 8%, 10%, 6%. You know, high single digits are solid or reliable. I go back off into forestry. The wood for a forestry project grows 6% per year in mass. So at the end of the day, your growth of your return is somewhat connected to actually the growth of the biomass of these products. And so I think returns around that fit what can be produced from the land instability indefinitely. Whereas when you get to really higher numbers, you have to have aggressive leverage or really kind of hard market risk, or it just gets complicated. So let's not make that also complicated. Yeah. Yes. Let's keep that part at least simple. Let's just keep it simple. That's what we're hoping to do. We fund the farm directly, get your return, get some products to get connected to them, see the impact, see what they are able to achieve with that capital, get paid back and do it again. I mean, there's so much more to discuss, but let's keep that for another time. I want to thank you so much, Dan, for your time today and for diving a bit deeper into the crowdfunding side of regenerative agriculture. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And if anyone wants to go to the website, they can go to gosteward.com, G-O-S-T-E-W-A-R-D. Thank you. I will definitely link everything we discussed below in the show notes. Thank you so much. Thanks. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course investing in regenerative agriculture and food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees and what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soil builders and investors in this space. The soil builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, 
permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning, I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you. If this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, Uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.